So good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's COMS educational webinar. I'd just like to say uh, a few housekeeping notes. Please, everyone that's joining, make sure your microphone is muted, your video is off. And if you would like, we are going to have a virtual social meeting or social session at the end of this webinar. A uh, little brief happy hour just to have everybody interact accordingly and make it a bit more jovial at the end. So uh, please feel free to continue to remain on the line. In any event, I trust that everyone is doing their best to juggle the challenges of work, COVID and family. It's now been nearly seven months since the borders have been closed and many of us have been uh, deeply affected by the COVID situation. And obviously at this time, it is clear that we're starting to see our second wave. But uh, many that have both participated in the past webinars and are on the line tonight would have been able to come out with us to the COMS Ski and Learn this past year in St. Anton, Austria. It was held in February. We had a wonderful time. Uh, it couldn't have worked out better prior to the closure. But as part of our trip to Austria, we did begin and had a day at KLS World in Germany. Uh, it was at their lead headquarters. Um, Jeff Ashby had initially ushered us in uh, to be able to be so close to the KLS team. And now Will Tecoris and COMS have had a very terrific partnership together. And it was only natural that we would ask them to be our official webinar supporter for this first webinar series uh, in October here. So before I introduce tonight's speaker, I'd like to share a short video of you uh, to support KLS. Thank you.
So once again, thank you very much, Will Takoris and your entire team. I should note that Will is joined by Mike Mantia, Sean Burke, and Justin Lyons from Kalis Martin to help support us today. Um, in addition, they have been a very great supporter of the COMS at our Ski and Learns as well as at our national meetings. We're once again advertising that at the current time, we're still a go for Whistler January 30th to February 4th, and hopefully the borders will open up for KLS to come and support us through that. Now, moving onwards for our speaker tonight, I'm pleased and thrilled to offer an introduction to Dr. Brian Farrell. Brian is absolutely no stranger to the COMS. He did present for us in Montreal, and I do recall him having an absolute splendid time out there partying, partying super hard. Uh, and he agreed to speak with us tonight on a very interesting topic uh, around orthognathic surgery. Um, Brian's background is that he completed medical school, his oral maxillofacial surgery training uh, in Louisiana State University in New Orleans. He now makes Charlotte, North Carolina home and practices at the Carolina Center for OMS. He maintains an assistant clinical professorship at the Louisiana State University in New Orleans and has been a board examiner for ABOMS. He's authored many articles and spoken around the world. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Brian to move forward with his presentation. Uh, once again, at the completion of the presentation, if you'd like to ask any questions, please uh, do so via the chat function, directing it towards Dr. Tony Chahadi. He's gonna be our moderator again this evening and he'll be able to ask your questions directly to, to Brian. Once again, for those of you that have joined a little bit late since our uh, introduction, we will be having a social hour or happy hour at the end of the procedure or end of the webinar, just to uh, lighten it up a little bit for everybody. So thank you and welcome, Brian. Hi, everybody. I uh, hope you're doing well. And listen, immediately right out of the gate, um, I hope we lighten it up right away, uh, meaning I don't think we have to wait till the webinar to, uh, or the, I should say the happy hour to, to truly be jovial and, and have a, a nice night. Um, truly, uh, thank you. Uh, Miller reached out to me a little while ago about uh, talking about um, well, whatever I wanted. And unfortunately, as you guys all know, I'm a one trick pony. So you know exactly what you're going to hear tonight. But he was asking me for a topic and then on a whim, I just thought geographical and said, Canada is on top. And without a doubt, Canada geographically is on top. We're calling uh, in from Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, we're considered South in the United States. If you think about Charlotte, uh, we geographically uh, have the luxury of being able to go roughly about 90 miles North to get to mountains. And we can go roughly about three hours South to get to beach. Um, if you think about North Carolina, South Carolina, most individuals from Charlotte will choose to go south to actually get to beach as opposed to going to uh, the Outer Banks or so forth within North Carolina because the distance is almost twice as far. Charlotte, North Carolina, recently I was traveling and I heard over the loudspeaker from the mayor that Charlotte now is the 15th largest city in the United States, which is incredible. Um, it doesn't feel like a big city, but at the same time, um, growing, we've got banks and, and airlines and so forth, and we have trees. When you think about Charlotte, also, we've got some sports. Uh, I'm a sports fan. I think many of you guys know that. Uh, we have the Hornets. We're not very good. We have the Panthers. We're not very good. We have NASCAR. We've got semi-pro baseball. We actually have a hockey team um, who, who, that won the minor league championship last year before COVID took effect. Uh, and we occasionally host a couple golf tournaments. I know many of you are thinking, uh, you know, Farrell, who is that? Um, the video, or I should say the, uh, the picture or the video that was sent out, I truly haven't looked like that for probably about six or seven years. I'm, I'm typically look a little bit more like the, the video from our ski meeting last year, a little bit more rugged. In terms of background check, um, I practice with Carolina Center for Oral and Facial Surgery, of course, uh, we have a little different model in terms of we are a private practice, but we are really ecstatic about having the academic association. We obviously have fellows. Um, we have 
uh, two fellows this year, Dr. Fagan and Dr. Um, Mascarenas down from Canada. And we also have uh, residents that rotate up from LSU. So the luxury uh, we have is not only, again, private practice, but the chance to do some academics. Uh, we're proud about the team that we've put together. And if you see the, the, the running list of surgeons there, um, at the bottom, you see the, the fellows and the resident that I mentioned, those are transients, which is why I've put an asterisk on them. But at the same time, uh, on the team is an in-house anesthesiologist. We have a conservative TMJ management uh, specialist, an oral facial pain specialist, and we also have two in-house prosthodontists that help us with uh, those extensive rehabilitations. So again, I, I kind of made the joke earlier about when, uh, excuse me, Miller looking for a title. Um, I kind of liked Wendell as the best you could send us. I, I just thought it was appropriate. At the same time, I just already kind of let the cat out of the bag that most of you in Canada are thinking, let me guess, um, it's got to be about orthognathic surgery because that's all he knows. And again, I'm not going to even debate that. I ultimately chose topics in, on, and around orthognathic surgery. Uh, I was, as Miller said, I was fortunate to travel to both Vancouver for the meeting several years ago, as well as Montreal, um, met great colleagues and great friends once again, of course, had known them for many years. Uh, Curtis Gill, who's a, a, a wonderful friend. You, you can see Miller and Graham and Carl and Taylor in some of these photos, which are a little blurry before the, the lights went out. Uh, obviously, Nick and Sean and, and certainly Graham uh, drinking from the chalice there. Um, again, all these are in clarity before uh, a few minutes later it got dark. We're making it rough on Wendell. Do you want to help take care of your child? No, I can't. I'm uh, working on a chapter for Pharaoh. I hope you everyone heard that. Um, that was Lennox, uh, Wendell, and Bianca's newborn who was smirking at the end of that staged photo that Wendell put Bianca and Lennox through. But um, we are certainly attempting to make it tough on him down here in Charlotte. Uh, Wendell uh, went back to Canada for a bit. He quarantined, he studied, he took his boards, his wife, and he had a baby, a beautiful baby named Lennox. And he worked on many projects that I put him through. I also gave him one more project and that project was for him to give you uh, a brief overview of, well, he's our special guest tonight. So I'm gonna give Wendell the floor for a few minutes. What's interesting is, and I think many of you know Wendell, I, I said, yeah, you can talk for two or three minutes. Within about three or four days, Wendell wanted five and then he came back a couple weeks later and said, I need seven. And then he said, I probably could get it done at, 12 or 15. I've tried to hold him back. Um, so here comes Wendell and it's your guess uh, how long this is going to last. Wendell, take it away. Thanks, Brian. So I'm here to give you a, as Brian mentioned, brief talk on the inverted L osteotomy. So the inverted L osteotomy is frequently applied to class two skeletal deformities that possess a short vertical ramus height and concomitant high mandibular plane angle. Now, the classic clinical vignette is someone that requires a significant counterclockwise movement to improve projection of the lower facial third. Now, this osteotomy was subsequently done through a submandibular Risden skin incision. And in the traditional inverted L via this extra oral approach, you can achieve remarkable results as we can see here. And it really was a game changer for orthognathic surgery. The problem is the first thing that a lot of people end up looking at afterwards is this large skin incision in the neck. And as you well know, for someone that's seeking orthognathic surgery, mostly for functional reasons, they do have cosmetic expectations. And this has led us to become very uncomfortable with performing the surgery. So is there an alternative? So here we can see a prototype on the left of a napkin that actually you know, Brian Farrell over here drew on at a bar one night and then subsequently developed a prototype for an intraoral cutting guide to do this entire procedure via a, a trocar and intraoral axis only. And once again, what we're trying to do here is achieve an aggressive counterclockwise rotation. As you can see here, our B points going forward 20 millimeters and pagonions going forward over three centimeters. 
and we're able to do this and achieve a remarkable facial change. A lot of people would not realize that the patient on the right and the left are actually the same person. And most importantly, as we've talked about, you've seen the change here. Now that we've gone intraoral and only using a trocar, we're going from this incision here that many of us would not feel comfortable with leaving on our patient for this procedure to a small dot trocar incision, as you can see here. So what are the indications? As we mentioned, large mandibular advancements, especially those involving a significant counterclockwise rotation of the occlusal plane to result in increased projection of the lower third of the face. High mandibular plane class two patients that require lengthening of the lower facial third, as well as a large advancement of the chin. And severe asymmetries of the mandible that require a significant correction of yaw or cant. Now, sometimes you'll hear us talk about the L, the inverted L osteotomy or the Z osteotomy. And this slide is just to illustrate the difference. As you can see in our inverted L, we're really going from an upper trajectory and then one 90 degree angle here. Whereas in our Z, we have an additional 90 degree cut, a back cut that goes to the posterior border of the ramus. What this does is the angle in a Z osteotomy is on the distal segment and the mobile portion of the mandible. Whereas with an L, the angle stays with the proximal segment. And the difference that this does is the angle, you know, joins the mobile mandible dental segment and, you know, can increase projection of the lower facial third. But you have to remember this adds a large degree of difficulty because you now have one more 90 degree back cut to do. And you need enough, you know, proximal segment bony uh, stock here to achieve plate fixation. So there's a couple of things you want to consider when you're debating between the L and the Z. So we want to run through some actual cases that we've done this year. And the first one we're gonna start off with is Lily. The reason why we chose Lily, other than her obvious convex facial profile, her microgenia and her retronathic mandible is, she is not the typical obvious inverted L patient in the sense that as you're gonna see, she does not have a very short mandibular ramus. She does not have a super high mandibular plane angle. Now, one thing you will notice also is after orthodontic decompensation, she has a significant overjet of over 12 millimeters. And that actually makes you know, traditional orthodontic surgery a little bit easier because you have an advancement built in just from your overjet. You'll see for another patient we present afterwards, if there's no built-in overjet, it's much more difficult to achieve a large mandibular advancement. So these are her photos prior to surgery and final records. And once again, as you can see, she has an extremely large overjet that we wanna kind of correct. So what are our options? We can do a BSSO only, we can do an inverted L and Lefort 1, or we could do a traditional Lefort 1 and BSSO. So let's talk about the BSSO only. As you can see here, we can achieve a large advancement of the lower incisor and pagonion, and we're able to do that because she has a significant overjet to start with. Lower incisors are coming for 13 millimeters and pagonion are coming for almost 15 millimeters. But one thing you have to worry about right away is, as you can see, these osteotomy gaps, we're looking at around 12 millimeters of a gap. Is that something we're comfortable with, you know, whether it's plate fixation, are we going to do screw fixation? And when we're moving a mobile ma uh, mandible to a stable maxilla, what are the chances that we're going to have some relapse after the surgery is done? We also have to think about bony overlap, you know, for a lot of surgeons that traditionally use either leg screw fixation or positional screw fixation, we're starting to run out of overlap and contact here. And if we think about, you know, three superior border screws here, this might be in the path of the inferior alveolar nerve. So these are things that we're kind of concerned about. Now let's go to option two. If we look at an inverted L and Lefort one, now obviously because we're involved in the maxilla, we're able to do an aggressive counterclockwise rotation of the entire complex. We're also able to further project not only the lower incisor, but pagonion can come forward significantly more because of that occlusal plane change. The other thing you'll notice here is that we're going to have a large gap at the osteotomy site. And this, you know, is something that you can either leave as a gap or you can uh, place a bone graft at the time of surgery as well. So in this scenario, we have lower incisor coming forward 15 and pagonion coming forward 20. And once Again, you can see the large bony gaps we have. Now, what we've done here is, you know, let's say we're not comfortable with the inverted L or we're not able to, you know, access these guides or plates that we're, we're not familiar with. What about our traditional Lefort 1 and BSS 
So and what we've done here is we've dialed in the exact same surgery with the same movements as before, because we were happy with the facial balance and the movements that we had achieved. Now, right away, if you look at this and experienced surgeons will know, we can see that the maxilla and mandible are in the same final position here, and they have good projection relative to maybe an artificial line coming down here from uh, the anterior nasal bones. But right away, you can see the overlap between the proximal and distal segments of the mandible is almost non-existent, and we have a massive osteotomy gap. So once again, our incisor and pagodian movements are exactly the same. But now look at the osteotomy gap. We're talking about anywhere from a 15 millimeter to 18 millimeter gap. Uh, I don't know about you, but it's going to be very, very uncomfortable to put a plate across this or put screws or what are we going to do to fix it, this and keep it stable. Once again, we can talk about our negligible bony overlap. It's getting even worse as we rotate the complex forward. And keep in mind, this is the best case scenario for overlap because we've chosen a patient that didn't have a very short ramus or a high mandibular plane angle. As you can see from other patients, if they have a very short ramus and steep mandibular plane angle, but to get aggressive counterclockwise rotation, you're barely gonna have any overlap at all. So then we look at another patient, for example, that we saw, and sometimes you end up having a compromise, especially if you're just doing a Lefort one and a BSSO. Here we can kind of see an artificial line as to, you know, with counterclockwise rotation, where do we wanna get this patient to? And the difference here you'll notice right away is short mandibular ramal height, steep mandibular plane angle, and we don't have a built-in large overjet. So this is not just a scenario we can advance the mandible to the maxilla and achieve you know, 10 millimeters, 12 millimeters, eight millimeters, any kind of overjet correction. So what we've done here is if you counterclockwise rotate the entire complex, you're still well short of your goal, especially at Pagonion, you end up adding a genioplasty trying to get there and how far can you really get to your line? So which option do we do? I went and talked to Brian and obviously, you know, as you've seen if, uh, from the previous video, this is what Brian used to look like. And he suggested maybe extractions and orthodontic camouflage. But I told him, you know, Brian, we're here to learn. We're here to do surgery. Maybe we can do a surgical option. So we went with the inverted L and the 401. So you can hear, see here some intraoral photos. And on the left, we have our uh, guide in place. Um, and as you can see, you know, we have our scores for where the ventral screws are going to be on the plate fixation. We have male and female attachments on the guide so that the trocar can fit in, making things easier. You know, this guide from that prototype we showed you at the beginning is probably on its 10th iteration. Every single time, just adding subtle details and making surgery easier and more efficient and quicker. And the right here, you can see finally our plate that's in place. It's, it's being screwed into the proximal segment. And we haven't finished our osteotomy yet because it's easier to put the plate on prior to separating the uh, mandible. So here we have some early imaging after the L and the Lefort 1. From the lateral stuff, you can see we've achieved a significant advancement of the mandible. We're happy with how things look. We're happy with the bony projection. And we can feel confident in our skeletal movement. We feel like we've done a good job for her. We feel like this is a stable movement. And uh, she's very happy. And we can put this in the wind column right away. Now, obviously, we only operated on her in July. So these are all early post-operative photos. Now, as I mentioned this patient we purposely chose because she wasn't your really obvious patient you know sometimes the decision is just made for you many times in your practice you will encounter patients like this where class two short ramal height steep mandibular plane angle not that much of an overjet what can we do and the nice thing is when you become more comfortable with these procedures and we start incorporating the inverted l here we had actually an l with a coronoidectomy looking more uh, similar to an ivro approach um, you can achieve movements of, you know, 13 millimeters at the incisor, 27 millimeters at Pagonion, and you can see the changes immediately. This is just on the post-operative table. You can see right away, look at how different she looks. And most importantly, I just want to highlight here, all done intraorally and then just a single trocar incision that many people use for standard uh, sagittal split osteotomies and something that people are very, very comfortable with. Now, I mentioned the Z osteotomy, so I just wanted to briefly show a case we did on that last month. Uh, this patient, once again, short mandibular ramal height, super steep occlusal plane, not a lot of overjet. Here we plan for a Lefort 1 uh, bilateral Z osteotomies and aggressive counterclockwise rotation and a genioplasty advancement. And you can see here, lower incisor comes forward 13, Pagonion 30 millimeters. And the thing I actually want to really show you is the occlusal plane change. You know, with count, we keep talking about this counterclockwise rotation, but her preoperative occlusal plane was 20. 25 degrees and we were able to change that by 16 and get to a, a more comfortable nine degrees so, so we're, we're looking at a lot of really really aggressive counterclockwise rotation 
So that concludes my portion of the presentation. Uh, you know, Brian's kind of message is he wants everyone to try this procedure and really get involved with this. So he wants you to do an inverted L. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Brian. It, it, we're like the news desk uh, where I come sliding in, he comes sliding out. Um, by the way, I don't remember saying camouflage and I certainly don't remember saying I want you or I want an inverted L. But uh, uh, thank you to Wendell. Um, truly, um, he's, he's a star. Uh, he came down and, and we're trying to teach him bad habits. Um, you gentlemen and, and individuals, females uh, at McGill have taught him tremendous. Uh, we are truly, truly trying to pass on some bad habits to him. Uh, here you can see him taking advantage of USA Healthcare, and you can see he's just he's just tossing uh, plates and screws to the side because it didn't work. Um, you know, we we we're trying to teach him to be cost effective and and efficient and knowledgeable. Interestingly, while Wendell was talking, and it's funny, uh, I gave him what three minutes, and it went on for twelve or whatever. So I do want to apologize in advance. This is going to go longer than an hour. Um, but also after reconsideration, I think I probably want to decline the invitation to speak. And the reason is, I think most of you who do know me, I, I'm, a, I'm a super social individual, and it is so disappointing to present to you from my conference room. We just had our um, janitorial services cleaning the trash cans behind me, and you are all going to go meet at some gorgeous place in Canada or Reykjavik, and because of the fact that I've, you know, spoke to you recently that I'm not gonna get a chance to go. So I am going to call it quits. I hope you guys all have a great evening and uh, look forward to seeing you next time we get together. I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> so we're all trying to be jovial. Um, Orthodontic surgery is carpentry. Um, it is facial carpentry. And uh, one of my first mentors was my father. Um, I was fortunate to be um, uh, around my father. My father was an oral and maxillofacial surgeon. Uh, ironically, um, my college roommate had jaw surgery and we were freshmen. It was uh, over the winter holiday and I observed my father doing orthognathic surgery on my roommate. I observed it and, and, and I then ultimately spent seven weeks with my roommate watching him recover from orthognathic surgery because back then they wired people's teeth together. And so I don't know if that's why I'm here, but you know, maybe internally that's why I'm here. But my father was a carpenter. Um, he has his carpenter license. We never slept on a Saturday morning we were always in building. We were building decks. We were running electrical. We were running plumbing. Um, this is the deck at our lake house. And the reason I bring this up is carpentry and getting off the path. I'm here tonight to talk about efficiency and ultimately talking about some things where things go amok, meaning the concept of measure twice and cut once. Uh, obviously, this is fantastic. Um, we cut a hole in granite and then elected to put in a, a faucet that didn't extend into the bowl. <clears throat> uh, in terms of fellowship, um, we're super proud down here at CCFS of the people that we train. Um, and by the way, we are not, we're not taking them and, and moving them to a different level. What we're doing is just trying to refine what they know because they've got fantastic training before they get to us. But we're just trying to pass on some some experience, some, some business, some uh, uh, acumen and so forth. So we're extremely proud about the people that come down and spend time with us. Obviously we're trying to not only uh, expose them to uh, surgery and, and business, but also to, to life. And so uh, annually we have a um, fellow party and these are our fellows that we put on the back of a boat. And this is life, right? Getting a, uh, you know, getting beer, make sure you can you can grab the beer out of midair um, while you are wake surfing. Make sure that you can drink it at the same time. Uh, interestingly, this, this is my brother Bart, and uh, he's wake surfing without the rope. And, uh, it's fun. We uh, work hard, play hard. Um, when you think about uh, orthognathic surgery, 
Um, I've talked about this for many years about how years ago it used to look like the Verizon map, meaning orthognathic surgery was delivered uh, all over the, the country, all over the continent of North America. Um, now, unfortunately, because of insurance and comfort level, individuals are now traveling to centers. And as opposed to looking like a map that covers the, the cellular service for the North America, now it truly is sort of the, the spots that light up at night. So it's your Vancouver, it's your Calgary, it's your Toronto, but individuals aren't getting this done in the middle of nowhere. And, and that is what it is. But when you think about that individual and that family that present to you from that initial referral and how far it takes to get an orthognathic surgery patient to final records, to planning, but also surgery, um, you're, you, there's a lot invested. Now, in the past, I've spent a lot of time talking about orthognathic surgery, but I've talked more focused on what uh, digital planning has done, meaning I have sort of left surgical techniques alone, and I've truly gone toward, you know, how can digital planning help us be more efficient and accurate as surgeons? Uh, honestly, orthognathic I want to take the osteotomies oh, yeah, that we do today. We are truly delivering osteotomies that have been in place for uh, years, decades, you know, all the way back blah, to... Blah, 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 blah. But the concept of this is there have been renaissances in orthognathic surgery. My, my, my roommates, again, did not have the luxury of rigid internal fixation. So rigid internal fixation to hold our carpentry together uh, allowed those individuals to mobilize earlier. If you look at these old school photos, I mean, look at these screws that we were placing. I mean, they were huge. I, we obviously got away from this type of, I mean, I don't know why anyone used, or why do we not use Phillips out of the gate, but there was square hex, there was, you know, all those sorts of things, but rigid internal fixation truly helped uh, transform things. The next one was virtual surgical planning, which came about uh, a decade or 12 years ago, and ultimately Gitano and Ja were, were brilliant. Gwen Svenen uh, in Belgium was brilliant regarding now merging the understanding of what happens at the level of the teeth, but what happens at the level of the bone. And it was, it was brilliant to understand, again, what happened outside of just teeth. And it made us obviously much better in terms of uh, surgery outcome and so forth. The new renaissance we're in is patient-specific implants, uh, custom fixation, and KLS, uh, tremendous uh, additive manufacturing, and development of plates and screws and guides that are now truly reverse engineered from the planning. We understand where we want the bite. We understand where the bony osteotomy has gone. And now how do we adapt custom fixation over that osteotomy? Now, stock fixation works quite, quite well. In fact, um, I'm a big proponent of L and J, we call it, meaning uh, on, the, on the left and the right buttress, it's an L and a J, and certainly if we can get by pinning things together with a plate or, uh, a, excuse me, screws in the mandible, that is certainly our preference. Now, if you think about doing the cases that Wendell just presented, um, by no means am I a proponent of customizing things in the mandible and customizing things in the maxilla. When you truly think about these individuals that, that uh, Wendell just presented on, we're bringing that mandible forward 25 millimeters, 30 millimeters in the begonion. And if you think about doing it with custom fixation, which is obviously the most complex osteotomy, listen, we may not get the A, but we may get the A minus. But if you truly now customize both jaws, ultimately we're gonna have basically this discontinuity. So there's, a, there's an advantage to using custom fixation in the, the complex osteotomy, mandible most likely, and then certainly bringing stock fixation uh, to bring that maxilla to the mandible. And the A minus in the mandible, bringing the maxilla to it is truly going to be an A when it's all said and done. Again, this is sort of the, uh, the concept of uh, the carpentry and just getting off the path. I, I think that's the point of this lecture is just basically getting off the path. So to flush the toilet here, uh, you have to run the water in the sink. So again, I'm gonna go a different direction, meaning we're now gonna talk about the surgical techniques that, again, we think have been constant from Obergazer. But in reality, you know, what can we do with these surgical techniques that we've been doing for years and truly make them more 
methodical, more constant, and more accurate so we can move efficiently through our surgical procedure. So the sagittal split osteotomy, and this isn't an op note, this isn't an op note, but just think about the steps that are required to go from beginning to end to do a sagittal split osteotomy. In fact, uh, bite block and, and hydrocortisone cream on the commissure. We don't put one retractor into the mouth until Ellie, my uh, surgical assistant, puts cortisone cream. We just sit and wait until she's ready to put hydrocortisone on the commissure. It's about this stepwise fashion of getting through the case. So here you can see just sort of these big bullet points of getting through an orthognathic case, mandible, the incision, well lateral. Um, now we're dissecting uh, to expose subperiosteally the, the border of the mandible, dissecting over the lingula uh, or lingual to expose the lingula. And now using a reciprocating saw. And when we're using the reciprocating saw to do the hunsuck, it's about ensuring that we're getting into the retrolingual depression. Now that you've done that and you're bringing it down the, the body of the mandible, remember it's, it's cognizant about the lateral border and, and thinking about where you're, you're making your cuts. Not right angles, but instead smooth contour so we're not making stress points. Get the bite block out. Now the most technique sensitive part of a sagittal split osteotomy is that inferior border. So in my hands, I like to separate my side first. So now I have the mandible free. So the junior surgeon, uh, the resident or the fellow who operate with me, I now can take the mandible and twist it. So I'm bringing that distal mandible up into their field of view to give them the best chance of ensuring they get through the inferior border. Once the osteotomy is cut, I mean, that's one thing. The, the, the lovely thing about a sagittal split osteotomy is there's two steps, the cut and now getting it to separate. And so if you think about doing the separation, it's making sure you see the entire thing. It's making sure that you're getting it to go favorably. And so now you're getting osteotomes and you're not fulcruming to avoid unfavorable fractures, but you're getting an osteotome and a fiber handle to work in unison. You're getting it to separate. You're identifying the nerve to ensure it's running in the right position. You've now got it separated. Now it's about putting it back together, whether you're an individual who likes positional screws, whether it's transoral or uh, via percutaneous access, positional screws or plate screw uh, fixation with monocortical uh, fixation. And then ultimately, of course, putting it back together. Interestingly, I, no one thinks about this, but no one thinks about what happened in the OR and now go back and now having to talk to the family. We were at a hospital that we don't typically operate um, at um, recently, and it was, it was a goat show. You know, we're trying to find pedals. We're trying to find drills. We're trying to find this. And when we, as the surgeons, walk out to the family, do we talk about the fact that we couldn't find a foot pedal? Do we talk about the fact that it was a goat show back there? No, their individual, their loved one is sitting there. Uh, well, looks like they've been hit by a truck, right? Obviously jaw surgery, we're, we tell them, we educate them that they're not gonna like us that first week. Woe is me, irritable, grumpy, I hate you. But when we walk out to the waiting room and we open that door and we see mom or dad or spouse or whoever it may be, you know, we all have what we say. It went well. It went the way it was supposed to go. Anesthesia went appropriately, no bells, no whistles. Surgery went the way it was supposed to go. We stayed on the path. We were never left or were never right. Think about this. When you're left or you're right off a path, you're not where you're supposed to be unless you choose to get off the path. But obviously we all understand when you're off the path, that's where challenges happen. So think about the concept of getting from start to finish. And it's about being methodical. It's a dance, you know, you name it, whatever you want to call it. Smooth, routine, methodical, start to finish. So when you go out and talk to that family, you can tell them, we, we did our best effort. We did everything we did. It went the way it's supposed to go. Again, you all know that when you get off the path, that's where challenges occur. Now, we get off the path. I operate with Wendell. <laughs> We're off the path all the time, I'm just kidding. But remember, getting off the path is about, number one, understanding where you're getting off the path, and if we can direct it and stop it, stay on the path, don't do that. Out that way causes problems, so let's bring it back together. But unfortunately, of course, things happen. 
So if we can redirect it and get you back on track, and this is something, for example, I'm illustrating a lingual segment fracture because we took out wisdom teeth. Now, listen, that is not a complication. That is not a complication at all. But now it obviously requires a little bit more diligence from a surgical side to make sure that we get it back together from a rigid fixation standpoint. So we ultimately end at the same place. Now, there's alternative routes. Maybe we're off the path for a bit. And as opposed to being sort of subtly off the path, we're off the path for greater periods of time. Again, it's about understanding an anatomy and not only getting things pinned back together so we can maintain continuity and reposition the distal mandible based on our plan, but also remember it's got to stand up to chewing. It's got to stand up to forces. It's got to stand up to musculature. But ultimately, again, understanding those concepts, we're probably going to add some belts and suspenders. Let's, let's not only put screws, let's put some plates. Let's make sure we have very aggressive fixation across this osteotomy. And ultimately, we're probably going to end up at the right destination. Things happen. Unfavorable fractures. We're now, now we get off the path. And now we've got things that are challenged. And challenges have to be, of course, addressed. And of, we're going to think about getting a mandible, for example, if we have a fracture of a buccal segment. The question is, as we're looking in the hole, can we still separate that mandible sagittally? If it's a large fracture, we probably can't separate it sagittally anymore. We probably have to make it into a vertical procedure. But if it's a small fracture of the buccal segment, we may we, we now be able to get a, a, a saw back in there and continue to split this mandible sagittally and get it basically into a part that contains the teeth and a part that contains the joint. Put it back together, whatever you uh, envision. And again, our hope is we bring this up to the point of reaching our destination. We were off the path, but we ultimately found our destination. You can see the arrow that kind of continues off screen. And the one off screen is the one that obviously we're not where we need to be. Maybe it's a bigger fracture, We've got a large piece. We're pinning it back together just for maybe a bone graft to ensure continuity. You can see this is our post-operative bite. It's not where we need it to be. And obviously, if you look at the post-operative film uh, from a radiograph, you can see that the suprahyoids are pulling the distal mandible down, the, the pterygoid slings pulling it up. So we have potentially a, a, a fixation issue. Again, it's about making sure that we're on the path when we're off the path, get back on it. And if we're not on it, let's do what we can to get to our destination. Uh, everyone who uh, knows me knows that I'm a huge fan of symmetry. I wasn't involved in this case, and none of you were, obviously. I, I realize that as well. But if you look at the rigid internal fixation in this panoramic film, you see three screws on the right, and you see multiple screws on the left. We obviously know that something intraoperatively has gone awry. We weren't in the room, but we are knowledgeable because we're surgeons that do this procedure. Now, when you hold this film up to a family on post-op day one, looking at their child, their son or their daughter, who's miserable, drooling, woe is me, and you hold this film up to the, to the family, the family looks at it and says, well, why is more on the left than the right? So, Again, I'm a, I'm a big fan of not only making sure that, of course, we bring things back together, but I'm a big fan of symmetry. So when it's all said and done um, and we get down to that great, great bite at the end, because that's what we're all after, no one knows exactly what happened interoperatively. Now, bringing it to specifics, again, I, I told you sort of some bullet points on the mandible, but think about doing the, the surgery that starts the osteotomy above the lingula getting into the retrolingual depression, and now, again, doing that osteotomy that parallels the lateral cortex. Well, look at this, and now you're operating with a junior surgeon, or maybe it's yourself, and you're watching how your saw goes. Well, you can see that this saw is lateral, way, way lateral than it needs to be. Stop. Whoa, whoa, whoa. This is going to get us off the path. So, again, it's about the, 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 the cognizance, the recognition to say, we're not where we need to be. Let's get back on the path. Now, moving forward through these bullet points, and you think about completing the osteotomy, and now we're doing the separation. And so now you think about 
I'm making the steps up 10, 11, and 12 to go from starting with an osteotome, fiber handle, and now beginning it to separate. Well, what if we do this and we go from here to here? And now we begin to see the fact that we're starting to get a segment fracture. We're starting to get a craze line that's going through our lateral cortex. Well, again, that illustrates we're getting off the path. Pause. So what do we need to do to move to get back on the path? Well, the answer is let's get back through the inferior border. It's the most technically challenging part. The structural integrity of a sagittal split osteotomy is when the inferior border stays with the proximal segment. So let's get back in there with the saw. Let's get back in there. Take your time. This is the whole case. Get back in there with the saw, get through the inferior border, and let's see if we continue to separate this mandible sagittally. Now, once you reposition it based on your plan, you can see that we have a, some, some areas of overlap that we may be able to get some screws in to basically reposition it based on our plan. And now we're gonna come back and get that segment over the top. You knew I wasn't gonna let you off. So now we're putting the saw back in and of course, look what we've done. This is, it's amazing, right? How hard is it for surgeons to stop and take a picture when things are going well, right? We're, we're, we're having fun, we're listening to music, we're moving through the case. You know, why stop and take a picture? Imagine how hard it is to stop and say, oh, we cut the nerve. We should take a picture of this so everyone can see. And I know the room's laughing. We can't hear it here in our isolated conference room, but I mean, let's be realistic. It's hard to stop and take pictures. It's really hard to stop and take a picture of a mess up. But obviously I was just trying to do this to kind of illustrate that board examination where no matter what you say, you're gonna spiral down to the point where, um, in fact, they probably died from an orthognathic case. But get back on track. And it's about repositioning or, or anastomosing uh, that nerve, whether it's uh, epineural sutures, whether it's coaptation with a, a conduit, uh, getting the bone back together. And ultimately, you're not gonna get, obviously, an X-ray intraoperatively, but just to kind of illustrate how you are trying to basically not only put the segments together, but that plate that comes across has a chance to do dual purposes. Meaning if a bicortical screw grows through a plate, it structurally is helping across the osteotomy. If a, if a monocortical screw is going into that plate just in that fractured piece, it's only holding that fractured piece. And, and again, I hope that makes sense. Uh, Game of Thrones, you can only imagine after a night in Montreal trying to, to uh, walk the stairs to, uh, you know, get to the Game of Thrones. <clears throat> um, thinking about maxillary surgery now, and I'm not going to berate it like I did the mandible, but when you think about, again, those bullet points, you know, bringing it truly to making the incision that has that hockey stick, using a, a Canadian reference, the hockey stick in the premolar area. I think junior surgeons, okay, we make a hockey stick. Do they, do, does, do they appreciate why we make a hockey stick? Meaning you're doing that, of course, to preserve labial blood supply to the maxilla. But the other thing that's important with a, a release that goes superior is if, in fact, you get maybe a little heavy-handed with your retractor, our hope is the rent goes up and not posterior to deglove potentially the tuberosity and cause increased vascular concerns. I mean, again... This is the thing that I think about, and I think that oftentimes it's overlooked because, you know, we're trying to kind of develop robots. This is what you do. This is where you make a cut. But think about those steps as you get through doing a maxillary procedure. Also, also think about getting off the path with maxillary surgery, whether it's bleeding, um, whether you preserve a vessel or whether you take a vessel. If you are preserving a vessel, that is, that's time. That's loss of efficiency in the OR, because as you're repositioning that maxillary segment, whether it's up, uh, north, uh, forward, whatever it may be, to truly sort of remove bony interferences around that nerve, that's time. Uh, I have never kept a descending palatine vessel. I was taught to take it. The truth is, if you take it, well, you can be pretty efficient, uh, efficient and aggressive removing the bone around that area. But 
potentially you put your saw a little deep when you're doing your parasagittal cut, or maybe we didn't reduce enough uh, nasal crest or cartilage in the septum causing deviation and of course nasal deformity. Segmental surgery indications. Indications to do segmental surgery are vertical and transverse, of course. If it's a vertical abnormality, that's a three-piece osteotomy, maybe a four-piece osteotomy. If it's transverse, it's either a two-piece, a three-piece, or, or potentially a segmental, uh, excuse me, surgically-assisted rapid palatal expansion. In regards to segmental maxillary surgery, in my hands, the preference is 2-3 for the interdental cuts as opposed to 3-4. The concept of doing 2-3 cuts is twofold. One is, if you look at a panoramic film that hasn't had any orthodontic therapy, the natural divergence between the canine and laterals generally provides space to perform that interdental cut. But more importantly, the reason why 2-3 cuts are preferable is it allows us the ability to control canine width. Having the canine in the posterior segment allows us the opportunity to control Bolton relationship. So we can place those canines, whether it's model surgery or digital planning, we can put those canines in the proper position because we can independently control them when they're in the posterior segment. Saws are better than chisels. Uh, a, a sagittal saw, a safe blade sagittal saw is by far more valuable than a chisel. If you truly think about doing an interdental cut with a chisel, the chisel is going to basically direct forces and it's going to go through the path of least resistance. The path of least resistance in the alveolus is going to be the PDL. We don't want our osteotomy going through a PDL. Also of note, the interdental cut should be done while the maxilla is up, while it's intact. It's like having this on a lab bench. I prefer to do it there. Why would you bring the maxilla down and now segment your maxilla? Now it's mobile and now it's harder to cut. So generally do your interdental cut when it is still intact with the superior maxilla. You're gonna remove bony interferences. We're gonna talk about harvesting the, the nasal crest. Obviously, Parasagittal cuts are oblique where the bone is thin, the soft tissue is forgiving, passive positioning of the segments, and also a streamlined splint. Meaning, if you are an individual who does segmental surgery and does not intend on keeping the splint in place, one, you don't need holes, two, it doesn't need to be big, bulky, where it's harder to pass those interfixation wires when you're doing IMF. So again, it's a benefit to do interdental osteotomies while the maxilla is stable. You can put a finger on the palate, you can feel it uh, tactilely as you're getting close. You're trying to essentially do it like a periapical uh, in between those roots. Now, once it's down, you can take the velar component that's completed and now simply complete those parasagittal cuts over the palate. Now, classically, segmental surgery required a splint. A splint was used to hold the dental alveolar segments in place. Think about segmental maxillary surgery. There's three places where we have the opportunity to control stability. Obviously, rigid internal fixation at the level of the osteotomy, we can graft the osteotomy with bone, with bone or we can stabilize those segments with that occlusal splint. However, when you think about the occlusal splint, the challenge with that splint is it, it's an interference. And what we mean by an interference is it interfered your ability to visualize your bite. They came back at one week and three weeks and they're biting into the splint. You're like, oh, it looks great. Now it's splint removal appointment. You pull it out and this is what you see. Now this is actually where you see it. Well, you had no idea that our bite was getting slowly, slowly off because the splint was obscuring our, our view. The second thing is, there's such an advantage to having the ability to view the occlusion, meaning I'm a fan of using elastics anteriorly to basically guide the coupling anteriorly. Uh, typically, it's a, it's a two, three from a lateral canine down to the canine on the bottom, meaning that first week, 
they don't want in your mouth. Let's keep those inside uh, elastics anteriorly. Let's work on getting the coupling. Now, once you have the coupling, now you can move those elastics posterior, put them in the premolar area, maybe in a box, maybe during the day, maybe just at night. And maybe after you've seen them for the third week before they go back to the orthodontist, maybe we're getting the premolars and the molars at night, and now we're settling that bite down. So when they ultimately get back to the orthodontist, we want that orthodontist to like what they see. This is a situation where they're now going back to the orthodontist. We just taken out the splint. They're going to the orthodontist from this appointment. Ugh. I mean, you know, use that emoji. What? Oh, I'm not so sure we want them to go back to the orthodontist at this point. Now, what are our orthodontic colleagues supposed to do after we do segmental maxillary surgery, particularly for transverse purposes? Well, they're supposed to help hold our expansion. And from the orthodontic world, that comes via a TPA, a transpaudal arch, or a heavier labial arch wire, which is what they call the Megamom. From a stability standpoint, I know you guys probably can't see me on my screen, but a TPA is more structurally sound than a Mega Mama because of the fact that it, it's, first of all, the Mega Mama is trying to hold out as opposed to being internal pushing out, but also a Mega Mama or a heavier labial arch wire is in the way of the orthodontist to do orthodontics. Again, here you can see an individual who has, a, it's not a segmental maxilla, but now in the post-operative phase, you can see how we have a chance to control coupling anterior in the beginning, but now move those elastics posteriorly. So at the bottom, you're seeing this individual heading back to their orthodontist roughly at a month. And again, we think the patient's happy, we hope the family's happy, and we certainly, certainly hope the orthodontist is happy because they can finish this. But when you have a splint in place, you're obscuring your view of what the bite you've established. Now, thinking about points of stability with segmental maxillary surgery, we've talked about rigid fixation. We're gonna talk about this in a second, but think about ways beyond an occlusal splint. Here, obviously, segmental maxillary surgery is necessary. You can see that we have a significant step between premolars and canines. They've done segmental mechanics, wonderful orthodontic therapy, class three asymmetric open bite malocclusion. Here's the expansion necessary in the canine area and the first molar area. You can see that we're roughly, we're over five uh, millimeters of expansion. Well, a palatal insert can be generated, which engages the embrasures. In our practice, uh, we actually have a lot of these embrasure uh, palatal inserts or splints or uh, orthodontic splints. Uh, implant splints printed locally, which certainly helps efficiency and cost containment. But here you can see that transverse constriction preoperatively. Here's a splint that has been placed intraoperatively. A circumdental wire is used to hold the palatal shells or excuse me, the alveolar segments lateral. And here's the day of palatal insert removal at roughly one month. They're numb, of course. All we've generally done is cut the wire here, the wire here. We're pulling that out. But essentially for a month, we've been able to have tooth-to-tooth -tooth contact and not the interference of an occlusal splint. Maxillary deficiency, transverse constriction, um, Irish. Um, here you can see uh, the expansion over uh, six and a half, seven millimeters as we gradually work through it. Again, these, these engineers can generate this embrasure that's going to help do it in the premolar area, in the first molar area, wherever it needs to be placed. Here we've tucked it under some buttons on the other side. There you can see the circum uh, dental wire that's holding it in place. But we've been able to maintain occlusal contact, but help hold that expansion with that palatal insert. A grad student, I'm starting school in like two months. I need this done. So the surgery early component, class three, there's uh, transverse constriction, maxillary hypoplasia, mandibular hyperplasia, obviously the plan running through it fast. There hasn't been time to diverge roots. Well, we can use technology to help us basically generate a guide, a clusal-born guide that's gonna come up 
and help us guide our sagittal saw through that narrow interdental cut. Is that going to ensure we don't get it? Nope, but it's certainly going to help us as we're trying to accomplish it. So again, you can see an occlusal borne guide, you can see the sagittal saw resting against the fence, and essentially, again, uh, trying to uh, navigate through that narrow area. Significant expansion. We've got nine millimeters of expansion, and here's that individual that comes back roughly at a three-week, four-week post-op. Tooth-to-tooth contact to help us bring those teeth together, but also here you can see that occlusal, uh, excuse me, that palatal insert that's helping to maintain and expand the shells. Now, at a month, whenever you're ready to take it out, three weeks, four weeks, six weeks, it is truly cutting, pulling it out, it drops out, they can jump up and, and obviously use the sink to brush their teeth or whatever. Um, and ultimately, we're sending them back to the orthodontist, hopefully with a bite that um, they're satisfied with and they certainly know they can finish. I've, I've done other things. We in the United States, I, I don't know how it exists in Canada, but it's pretty rare that we see banded uh, first molars, um, but ultimately uh, I continue to look at ways to try and help keep those dental alveolar segments expanded. And so here I've bent a K wire. Uh, this is a K wire that we've taken a piece that went in the radix of the nose. And ultimately um, we've not only used the K wire, but we've grafted the uh, palette for continuity. But here you can see uh, me putting a K wire into the lingual sleeves or palatal sleeves to help maintain the expansion of the segments and avoid uh, occlusal contact via a splint. And here you can see sort of the contour well away from the soft tissue. Uh, questioning planning, forgive me, I'm gonna have a drink. Um, nothing better than going to the uh, blue um, standing side by side with your mate. <clears throat> Asymmetric dental facial deformity, lovely young lady, but you can see the skew, obviously uh, functionally nicely aligned teeth, but obviously because of the skeletal discrepancy, um, functionally that's a challenge. That's how we in the United States uh, stress that to our insurance provider. We're all familiar with the conventional workup of face bow and mounting and mount, uh, scoring and moving and repositioning. Uh, this is certainly more realistic of model surgery. But the challenge with model surgery, and I, we're all aware of this, is we had no clue when an inaccuracy developed. And so if we had an inaccurate centric relation record, unfortunately that was carried through every step of model surgery, oblivious of the fact that we were off. Well, digital planning obviously gives us the ability to visualize errors, particularly centric relation record. So as data is sent to KLS, they now can, can visualize the fact that that condyle is not seated. And this is a tremendous illustration of this. Here's an isolated mandible case. But if you look at the predicted overlap, or I should say osteotomy gap of the mandible, you know, a couple millimeters, but if you truly look at the clinical delivery, Intraoperatively, we seeded the segments. And so now we have put things back where they belong and we have a much, much greater osteotomy gap. And so because of that, there is an advantage to doing mandible surgery first. We as a society have been taught to do ma maxillary surgery first. It's about where you wanna put the maxillary incisor. You never, I mean, should say, rarely cannot get through a maxillary procedure. But if you do mandible surgery first and you have an unfavorable fracture that doesn't let you get through it, obviously the case is over. But doing mandible surgery first allows the opportunity to reposition the mobile distal mandible to the stable position of the maxilla. And if we do sound clinical surgery, keep that segment, despite the fact that we have inaccuracy of numbers, we should still deliver accurate clinical result. So in my practice, I'm a big fan of doing mandible surgery first. It doesn't matter if we get the maxillary incisors in their position in the first 45 minutes, or we get it in the position in the first 90 minutes. Ultimately, we're going to ultimately end up in the same spot. Now think about setting the occlusion. Uh, years ago, 
surgeons have to accept the exclusion, we would forward that to the uh, engineers and they would basically move our occlusion around in space. Well, obviously the world is moving to a digital medium and optical scanners and, and our cone beam CT scans, occlusions are now being set by our engineers. Well, when we made the move to digital planning probably five years ago, I noticed that we were doing far more segmental surgeries than we had in the past. And ultimately, I asked some engineers, I said, are, are, are we doing more surgical uh, segmental surgery? And they did a review of myself and four other orthopedic surgeons. And ultimately, you can see that in my hands, we're doing segmental surgery roughly 70 to 75% of the time. The world, as they've moved to the digital medium, has now gone from roughly uh, below 20% to roughly just under 30%. So segmental surgery is important because as we get to the digital medium and can spin this around and truly want to get that foundation over the lower arch for not only our patients, but our orthodontists, there is more segmental surgery that's going to be done. We validated it in our practice with 20 uh, in-house cases versus 20 cases that an engineer set and us haptically setting an occlusion and the engineers setting our occlusion we found that they did it uh, with just as uh, great reliability and validity than we could do. And so it's that step off the cliff for those that haven't done it yet, but without a doubt, the, uh, the engineers uh, at KLS and GSS, they do a wonderful job. We get tremendous insight. We understand the osteotomy gap. We understand fixation needs. We understand, in fact, Wendell and I were talking about this uh, before we went on. You understand the, the amount of bone that potentially needs to be re removed for a setback uh, within uh, a mandible it, um, in terms of the distal mandible, uh, the distal portion of a proximal segment in the superior border, and certainly positional screws. This is important, and I, I believe this is important because I think we as surgeons should spend more time on this screen because ultimately this screen is going to help us not only at our planning, but it's gonna help us intraoperatively not spend as much time dealing with mitering and proximal and distal segment positioning. So if you think about that midline sagittal plane and they're taking measurements out to canines and, and mesiobuccal cusps and now at the angle, well, it's to our advantage to take the complex and to rotate it counterclockwise because that is going to reduce the interference on the right side and make sure this matches better. Now, why that's important is it's going to allow us to move intraoperatively more efficiently and smoothly through our case, because we are not going to have to do that bony mitering. Uh, spending a little bit of time on the case to make sure that we have it aligned lets us move more uh, efficiently through our surgery. At the same same time, if it's a symmetry, a symmetry or you want to put more uh, projection on one side, you, you have to do that. But for a great, great, great majority of the cases, spending time looking at the submental view to ensure that there's passive positioning of the segments, the better. This is a, a, an illustration of those 40 patients. I was taught to use lag screws. And I know eyes are opening up your, your oh, lag screw. You're compressing the nerve or you're torquing, displacing the condyle. Well, if you notice, we are not displacing the condyle despite the use of lag screws because we have spent time on the planning session ensuring it's passively positioned and things should not be torqued. Aesthetic, functional occlusion, uh, certainly symmetry and proportions, and, and we all know uh, as orthognathic surgeons, this is why we do what we do. Think about uh, another point of stability uh, with segmental maxillary surgery. Think about the osteotomy gap, bone grafting. Uh, we just submitted a, a paper to um, journals, whoever will take us in fact, but ultimately we, there's, in our opinion, roughly 12 spots that you can find bone, autogenous bone, when you're doing orthognathic surgery. So if you do, for example, a class three individual and you do mandible surgery first, well, as we set the distal mandible back, we need to remove bone from the proximal segment. 
for three reasons. To avoid over rotating the segment, to avoid uh, or to help with visualization and to avoid periodontal issues. So we're essentially going to harvest that bone. And if you do mandible surgery first, that bone now can be repositioned uh, throughout the rest of the procedure, wherever it may be necessary in osteotomy gaps. So in my hands and Wendell's as well, once we separate the mandible into proximal distal, we immediately grab it with a coker and we cut off the bone. We look up at our case report. We need to take off four and a half millimeters of bone. Let's take six. So we cut off that portion of the distal segment. We also come in and pull off the superior portion of the proximal segment, again, to avoid over rotation and to aid with visualization. But ultimately, that bone, that matchstick, and that bone can be, again, as I mentioned, repositioned wherever it needs to be within uh, other parts of the osteotomy. So again, with mandible surgery first, there's a tremendous opportunity to harvest autogenous bone. We obviously need to reduce interferences. When I was coming through as a junior surgeon, once we had the maxilla down and, and it was mobilized and passive, an aggressive burr was used to basically just obliterate those posterior interferences. And we used to collect that as slurry. We grab that slurry and we'd pull it in and potentially use it to pack it into osteotomy sites. What you didn't realize is that we irrigated when we were putting fixation on the anterior maxillary wall. And I trust we flushed every bit of slurry down the back of the uh, throat into our throat pack. Well, think about the bone that's available posteriorly, particularly if you're doing a, a posterior superior repositioning or whatever it may be, that bone in the back, it's to our advantage to reduce it. So that way, as we're auto-rotating the maxillomandibular complex in place, the interferences are on the anterior maxillary wall and not posteriorly. We call this a green pepper. So we use our reciprocating saw and we literally cut uh, over the back of the posterior maxilla. The advantage is it often unroofs an impacted wisdom tooth, but we now can harvest that bone for use some other spot. The, ma the, the nasal crest, think about the nasal crest of the maxilla. We can harvest that um, of the maxilla. Which again, we want to remove, so um, uh, I should mute it. So but um, we have pH. cameras in our uh, so OR, and so they oftentimes uh, film us doing cases. But here you can see the reciprocating saw, and what so we are right, doing is the, uh, truly uh, just cutting uh, basically a diamond kind of pattern and cutting off the nasal crest of the maxilla. I hope I'm telling a joke in the OR. Everyone I've been with knows all my jokes. Uh, I'm a one-trick pony. But obviously, you can see after basically, uh, okay, I don't know, so 15, 20 seconds, we now have harvested that nasal crest of the maxilla. And think about taking it from here where it anatomically started and now putting it into a parasagittal cut. Parasagittal cut. We also do that with the reciprocating so. When you think about the alveolar shelf and you think about the palate, there's a lot of freedom with that soft tissue. There's a lot of forgiveness. But using the reciprocating so particularly standing it up, it's not end cutting. So if you stand it up, it's not end cutting. Uh, you'll, you'll watch truly within um, 15 or 20 seconds, we can put a, a little osteotome in there, kind of free it up. And now we've segmented it as opposed to uh, a Fisher Burr or um, Sonopet or Osteotomes. Osteotomes or whatever. Here you can see uh, a post-operative radiograph where now you're restoring the continuity of the maxillary palate by putting in a cortical cancellus bone that you've harvested either from the mandible or maybe the nasal crest. Uh, here's a, um, an individual who has Invisalign and um, you notice the colors, um, these are LSU colors. We had a wonderful, wonderful football year last year. Um, here you can see the extent of advancement uh, with this Invisalign case. We use, uh, for in-house cases, we're trying to keep it efficient. We use a, a, a company called uh, Guided Surgical Solutions. But here you can see that individual return to the orthodontist. Um, this individual came from St. Louis, um, so they flew back and this is their first visit to the orthodontist. But you can see without a splint, um, we've been able to generate a, a, a nice occlusion 
Uh, they placed some buttons as opposed to uh, continuing for us to put tabs in, so to speak. And then in our office, uh, particularly when we do these cases, we have the ability to now optically scan these individuals while still under uh, anesthesia. And so we now have the uh, reference of that maxillary arch, mandibular arch, and we can take that STL file. Does the orthodontist want it? Do we want it? And we can generate trays, um, which may be delivered um, within a week, as opposed to getting back to an orthodontist where if they have trismus or decreased range of motion and can't get the wand in, uh, it may be four or six weeks. Grad student, need it done, surgery early. Um, you've seen this before. Um, significant expansion. Here you can see tooth to tooth contact, that paddle insert holding things together, expansion. Uh, it's pretty rare in Charlotte, North Carolina. I, you in Canada are going to tell me if you guys see banded molars. Uh, it's quite rare, uh, in our opinion, to find banded molars. But this is me taking a K-wire, uh, the remnant of a K-wire that's put at the radix of the nose. And now I can take the K-wire and, and bend it to um, a post-surgical model. And then I can use a, a diamond burr and basically feather it so it literally engages and pins into the palatal sleeves, which again helps me maintain expansion of the shells without using a splint. This is the last splint I left in place. And I think that uh, many individuals um, have heard about this, but this is truly the last splint I left in place after segmental maxillary surgery. Uh, it was necessary in this situation as uh, this is the 12 piece maxilla. Bit of a stretch. Everyone have a drink. Um, I highly recommend an uh, Wendell and I talk a lot about life and, and surgery in, in United States and Canada. Um, Ellie has been with me for 16 years and Ellie is a surgical tech. So if I deliver surgical care in my office or I deliver surgical care in the hospital, Ellie goes with me. Again, 16 years, we don't even talk. Uh, we put our hands out. Wendell knows not to talk or ask for anything. Uh, Ellie's going to put the instrument that he needs in her hand. So again, um, highly recommend an Ellie. And why Ellie's important is think about efficiency. Again, this has sort of uh, been the, 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 the concept of this uh, lecture is Minimizing things. What do you truly use when you're doing an orthognathic case, maxillary surgery or mandibular surgery? There's no sense having a hundred instruments out, but think about those uh, instruments that you use constantly, constantly, and constantly. So again, the, the instrumentation that we classically use for a mandible, I'd even make the argument, Ellie put it out, I, I don't use a Smith spreader. Uh, I haven't used a Smith spreader in a long time but she has it in the field. But the point is, notice the minimalistic aspect of the instrumentation needed for orthognathic surgery. Maxillary surgery, you'll notice a uh, similar sort of instrumentation, but a bone hick to hold it down, uh, osteotomes to complete the down fracture, and this is an SR. And an SR is nice because an SR irrigates and it suctions. It's a, it's a tremendous tool uh, that I think everyone uh, should add to their armamentarium. So in, in CCOFS, uh, we are truly trying to do things beyond just dental alveolar in our office. We're fortunate to have a wide scope, orthognathic, of course, but we can do arthroscopy and cosmetic surgery uh, through Dr. Muhammad. We uh, do all on four, zygomatic um, and surgically assisted rapid paddle expansion. So again, in our office, we're trying to be uh, efficient and cost effective and so forth. Uh, we're accredited in North Carolina um, by AAAHC. And again, we have done, I believe over 1,350 uh, cases orthognathic within our office setting. Uh, Dr. Leinberger is fantastic, um, but again, maintaining cost, but at the same time delivering accuracy, safety, and um, efficiency. 
when I first started, in, in fact, I was just new to Charlotte, North Carolina, and the first orthognathic case we did was in a small room. It was just 14 by 16, and now we currently operate in, in our current surgical facility, and you can see it's, it's a bigger size, which allows a little bit more freedom, and uh, we're fortunate to have a lot of people that come and observe, and, and there's room for them to move around. Our philosophy uh, generally, uh, when we started, was very simple. And once you become more confident, obviously, you become more confident not only in anesthesia, but you become confident in surgical delivery. Uh, Wendell and I, in the last two weeks, have delivered uh, two triple jaws for OSA in our office. Uh, we've done maxilla, turbinates, mandible, and genioglossus advancement within our office. Um, two and a half hours. Uh, those individuals are truly going home in uh, two hours after the surgical procedure. And that, that's not to ooh and ah, it's just to tell you that um, our anesthesia team is fantastic. It's not us as surgeons, it's the anesthesia delivery. We truly try and set sort of a time limit for anesthesia. We don't want it to get too long, but our anesthesiologist, Dr. Weinberger, uh, as we begin to close, um, things are beginning to turn off. And as we're truly putting a caramet on an individual, that tube is coming out literally within a minute. And those individuals are blinking, um, we're done. Um, so again, not us as surgeons, but certainly the anesthesia delivery. If you look at the hospital day versus an office day, uh, you know, this is a couple of years ago, but you can see uh, obviously a great hospital day, but in between those cases, do you know what Brian Farrell does? Brian Farrell uh, drinks soft drinks and eats chips and doesn't do one other thing besides just sort of chill. Whereas you can see a day in the office is uh, double jaw, single jaw, but in between those cases, we're seeing post-ops, we're doing final records. So uh, when you deliver this stuff within your office, um, it truly allows you autonomy and, and to be more productive. I also showed you real quickly, just to bring this into focus, um, an arthroscopy tower. Um, we perform arthroscopy intra uh, office in our own office, and we can do um, surgical arthroscopy, displications, um, even discectomies via our um, arthroscopy using laser and um, radio frequency uh, within our office, which truly has helped it be. Again, not only the autonomy from a surgical perspective, but also very profitable for uh, CCOFS. Again, you can do surgery within the office. Um, I, I think it's important, of course, we're not being, um, uh, we're not mavericks, we're not doing things outside what we think is traditional, but it allows us the ability to deliver care, uh, particularly for those individuals that uh, can't afford um, care that uh, typically may be in within a hospital setting. Um, as we sort of get to the finish, I know we've certainly gone beyond an hour. Um, the oak seed is certainly a nice touch here. Um, grabbed a uh, construction cone to make sure it made it into the toilet. Um, my, my first mentor obviously was my father. My second mentor was Dr. Kent at LSU. And my third mentor was Dr. Tucker, uh, of note, this is one of the last surgical cases that we performed together. And the reason I bring this up, in fact, Wendell said, why are you talking about this? And I said, there's a story. And so what I want you to notice is the rainbow burr on the left side. So you can see I was the uh, maybe number one fellow at this point. And so I had just completed my uh, cut with my rainbow burr and I brought the rainbow burr back underneath my hand to put it back on the patient's chest so I could be ready to receive the screw. And Dr. Tucker was bringing his hand forward and I ran the rainbow burr into the webbing of his hand. Ow! And so it was uh, a bit of awkward silence for a couple minutes. And then once I sort of felt like the, uh, the mood had moved, I said, did you get the depth? Uh, complications with orthognathic surgery, again, you've heard me say a few things. Uh, we followed 1,000 consecutive people that had orthognathic surgery, 1,692 cuts of bone. You can see it there. I'm going to run through fast. Think about, um, let me show a, a show of hands. What, what percentage?
procedure did I do here that caused this amount of bruising? Not a lot of hands going up. Um, obviously, um, this was removing hardware. This wasn't even an orthognathic procedure. This was just removing hardware. Um, I've been fortunate to kind of see it all. You can see the vignette. Wendell talked about this earlier, about doing a sagittal split osteotomy and aggressive advancement on an individual that has that vignette, but uh, maintains a high mandibular plane angle. So you can see initially post-surgical final result and ultimately after several years, continued degenerative change led to um, the need to potentially think about something again, surgical. Surgical growth for that class three patient, you're timing, you're timing, you're timing it, trying to make sure that their, uh, their growth is complete. If you wanna use the analogy of a gas tank, their, their lights on, but there are individuals who occasionally uh, grow out of it and uh, we bump that maxilla forward again. Uh, interventional radiology, a late bleed. This is always Saturday night. Never happens at um, 10 o'clock on a Tuesday. This is Saturday night, you're out and about and all of a sudden your patient's in the emergency room with um, blood that looks like they've been shot. Um, a class two individual. Uh, and Truly, I'm sorry, everybody, we're nearing the end. Please, please fill your drink. Uh, this was uh, recently, um, we moved a mandible forward. Uh, it was truly return, uh, routine from a surgical standpoint and an anesthetic standpoint. Ultimately, um, after a day, I'm driving back to the uh, office to see some consults and I get a call from our fellow Dr. Jim Howell who says, um, you need to come back. So, we had a locum tenens anesthesiologist who was not familiar with orthognathic surgery, who was doing some rounds um, that afternoon and looked at that individual who had had mandibular advancement surgery and felt as though um, they were concerned about airway. And so encouraged um, before uh, everyone went home to bring that individual back down to make sure we secured an airway. What I want you to notice as we went into the operating or back into the OR, uh, the young lady was satting, you know, 99, 100%. Um, but ultimately, as you all are watching this, you can see how we go from sort of typical um, SAO2, and then you can begin to see it uh, dissipate. Well, obviously, um, uh, they went back in the OR, and um, they could not get an airway established, a laryngospasm, and Dr. Jim Howell uh, saved this patient's life by doing a cricothyrotomy. Um, and then ultimately, I turned my car around, of course, came back in and uh, walked into the room to see uh, an ear, nose, and throat putting a uh, trach into my patient's neck. Um, no one had a chance to look down in the hole to, to determine if, in fact, an airway could have been established. But um, Dr. Tucker has taught me, if you practice long enough, everything that's happened to everybody else will happen to you. Um, honestly, I don't know if this is going to happen to 90% uh, of you, but at the same time, um, boy, if you can take easy, take easy, because um, obviously staring at the ceiling, um, worrying about this, and this individual um, literally had to be um, trached for 14 days. They decannulated her and, um, you know, something that probably likely didn't need to occur. Um, her bite's wonderful, but she has, you know, just awful keloids and hypertrophic scars. In conclusion, uh, a young lady who has an asymmetric class three skeletal malocclusion. Here's data collection and just kind of a red herring to kind of give you an indication of where I think or where we're heading. You can see a motion artifact. Well, after surgery, of course, it, anesthesia went great and surgery went great, but um, she um, had a sore throat following the procedure, um, rated it a four out of 10. Um, a nurse on the floor gave her delauded for breakthrough pain. She ultimately got up about an hour later uh, to use the bathroom and, and fell down. Uh, the emergency response was started, hypoxia. Um, despite uh, using a rebreather, they couldn't get her oxygen saturation where it needed to be. Essentially, they figured it was coughing against the closed glottis. Uh, sent to the uh, ER for a chest x-ray and uh, she dropped a lung um, because she was coughing against the closed glottis. 
So postoperatively, roughly day one, she ends up getting a, uh, a chest tube uh, to evacuate a pneumothorax. In our institution, because uh, she has a chest tube, she's sent to a Levine's Children's Hospital for the intensivist to uh, monitor. It continues, and, and roughly a couple of days later, they get the chest tube out on the right, and, and um, she's not doing better. It continues to sort of have hypoxia, and she ultimately ends up dropping her lung on the left side. So now she has a second chest tube on the left. Now we're roughly about um, four or five days into her hospital stay, and there's this growing subjective thought that she has the inability to swallow. Now, uh, she has this persistent deer and headlights type expression. Uh, the concept of inability to swallow continues to sort of crescendo. So it becomes an issue. So now uh, truly every uh, discipline within the hospital is uh, consulted and they elect to put a nasogastric tube in for nutrition because uh, she ultimately has not swallowed. Here you can see our swallow study and they feel as though she's got some silent aspiration. Our ear, nose, and throat physicians are doing nasal pharyngoscopy, and things appear as though they're going well. Neurology wants me to take out the plates and the screws so they can get a better MRI to evaluate if there's something within her cranium, uh, a lesion, um, and so forth. But of note, of note, while sitting there talking to her during rounds, there is no saliva that is pouring out of her mouth. So she is swallowing her own saliva. But as we ask her to swallow, um, unfortunately, it's just not there. So obviously a prolonged hospital course. You guys saw my line earlier about a smooth and efficient path through the, um, through the case. But here's a, an unsmooth path through. Um, maybe this is a better view of it. But ultimately, she went home on post-op day 36. And the ultimate reason why she went home on post-op day 36 was on post-op day 35, she had a procedure. And that procedure was the placement of a G-tube. So they placed a G-tube to provide enteral feedings for this young lady because uh, on um, swallow studies, um, Unfortunately, they still felt that she wasn't quite up to speed. Uh, honestly, I think probably most of our orthognathic patients probably have a degree of this, but uh, it became sort of the empty degree. We did a literature search evaluating this, and, and ultimately, there's up to 2%, generally less than 2%, that have challenges following orthognathic surgery with swallowing. Uh, one case from Dr. Van Sickles in Kentucky was hypertrophy of the cricopharyngeus muscle. They ultimately did an abl ablation and that helped. The other ones that are noticed uh, or mentioned are globus hystericus and compromised intellectual ability. Ultimately, she got out of the hospital at post-op day 36 and our initial post-operative visit was at seven weeks. Uh, we were obviously very fortunate that her bite looked great. But um, again, it comes back to the concept of when you can find easy, take easy, because there are going to be things that you don't expect that are going to take you down this path. Again, that's the, the concept of this lecture. You're going to take you down this path that's going to get you off the path. And it's, again, about getting on it uh, to get those people to the destination that they need to be. Efficiency, uh, hopefully, has been uh, kind of the concept of this lecture. I apologize. It's gone long. I'm going to blame it on Wendell. Um, um, but um, obviously, surgical procedures, um, focusing truly on each step that you're doing, it's more routine. It's more predictable. And hopefully, when it becomes more routine and more uh, predictable, it's less stressful. It becomes very methodical. Not rushing, not rushing, mind you. But orthognathic surgery truly should be done. If it's a mandible, it should be done under an hour. If it's a double jaw, it should be done under two. And that's, that's what happens when you truly think about the steps. Uh, guys, uh, to be uh, very forthright with you, um, my laptop crashed last night at roughly about 1130. And so this is my laptop. This is my presentation this morning at 645. 
Um, everything that I had put together for um, the past three or four weeks was lost. So today in between patients has truly been me adding and throwing things in. So maybe that's why it got a touch long because I don't remember exactly what I put together. Um, but truly, uh, I thank you for your time. Um, I truly look forward to sitting here and having a little social hour with everybody and look forward to asking uh, or answering some questions. Uh, thank you to the Canadian Society, to Dr. Shahadi, to, to Miller Smith, uh, to all the friends, to KLS Martin for the support and um, all the best. I can't wait to see you truly live at a meeting. Dr. Farrell, thank you for, uh, for sharing your, your, your wealth of experience with us. Uh, and, uh, and I have a couple of questions for you. First of all, um, what are you drinking? Ryan? I'm drinking um, Blade and Bow or Jefferson Ocean Cats. I actually look for something Canadian. Um, I want you all to, to see this, and, and maybe I should back this up. Um, if I can back this up, let me see if I can do this. Um, if you look at the screen, and probably Dr. Shahadi's blocking it out, but I truly... Oh. There we go. Trying to, I truly was trying to uh, be my best Canadian today as I was bringing this presentation together uh, to be a Mountie. Um, but I, didn't, I didn't get any Canadian whiskey. Is that, that's, that's Wendell's fault, isn't it, though? Uh, everything is Wendell's fault. Is Wendell. Tony, uh, no one knows that more than you, but everything <laughs> is Wendell's fault. My, my last off-topic question is um, there's been a, a preponderance of or a sprinkling of uh, bathroom photographs in your presentation. And we were just wondering if there's, a, you know, some kind of hidden message there or, or, you know, some kind of fetish that we should know about or anything, you know? Well, what's interesting is I rarely go, meaning um, I usually just um, let it go wherever I am. Uh, in the in the uh, party, um, but yeah, I, I I'm yeah I, I don't even know how to no comment. How's that, Tony? No comment on that. Well, fair enough, fair enough, fair enough. Um, so now I, I I will ask you a couple of questions that have come in from uh, from some of our uh, our audience. And uh, one quick question I think we can address right off the bat is an observation from one of our one of our attendees is you pointed out. Uh, Thanks for the lecture. You pointed out that in the first inverted L osteotomy case, the bony gap uh, you uh, would get, sorry, two seconds. Let me just orient this properly. You pointed out in the first inverted L case, the bony gap you would get from a BSSO. Uh, don't you think you're going to get an even worse bony gap with an inverted L? And I think the, the focus of the question here is you've just moved the bony gap from the ramus instead of the body of the mandible. And the question is, do you graft these cases, these gaps routinely? Yeah, uh, wonderful question. Great question. Obviously, um, uh, an inverted L is a butt joint. It's a butt joint. And so, um, yes, um, bone grafting needs to be done. I'm not a fan of using a hip. They're truly over orthognathic surgery, but more uncomfortable with their hip. So in my hands uh, with these cases, I like to use cadet, uh, cadaveric bone, cortical cancellous cadaveric bone, and uh, bone morphogenic protein sponge. Okay. Um, do you ever find, in the context of that, that procedure, uh, indications for removal of the coronoid? Well, absolutely. And so if you think about an individual that has the vignette, if they have aggressive degenerative joint disease and they've lost vertical ramus height, occasionally that coronoid will truly be above the zygomatic arch, which is uh, the definition of, you know, coronoid hyperplasia. In that situation, there may be an advantage to doing uh, the IVRO. So we would, in the alphabet osteotomy that we talk about, there's an advantage to releasing the temporalis tendon and rotating that distal segment, even the coronoid down, because that gives you a better vertical overlap. So it's truly about looking at the ramus you're gonna release the temporalis tendon, of course, because that distal segment has to come forward. 
but it's, it's about the anatomy that you're looking at when you do planning. But you're absolutely right. Sometimes there's an advantage to rotating the coronoid down because that gives you better overlap of your vertical uh, osteotomy. Okay. Great question. Uh, another question is, um, well, in the context of the coronoid, do you ever modify your plate design to have uh, holes for the plate within the coronoid process? Uh, absolutely. Uh, the lovely thing about uh, patient-specific implants um, is you can, you can place these holes wherever you feel like they need to go. Um, if you want to cross the osteotomy, uh, for example, down at the inferior border, um, wonderful. But theoretically, by doing that, uh, you, you'll notice in some of the stuff that Wendell showed earlier, you're almost getting the tension band concept by putting that uh, horizontal bar that is at the most superior portion of the, the distal segment. It's, it's uh, the, the proverbial belts and suspenders. So I know the following question is a bit uh, somewhat, uh, it's, it's like a board exam question, but I'm just curious if the circumstances under which you practice have changed the scenario in which, in the timing of the correction of class three malocclusions in male versus female patients that, for example, are in the, in the 17 to 18 year age range. What's your uh, default or preference for when you, when you time your surgery for the correction of these to address residual growth? I asked Wendell if he wanted it. He didn't want this one, but let's get Wendell one. Um, so, and again, uh, listen, uh, Dr. Shahadi has his thought on this and, and uh, Dr. McCool and, and everyone's got their thought on this and, and I'm not the expert on it, but so I always talk to individuals and patients about, um, you know, the timing of all this. And so when you think about a patient that has this deformity and they're thinking about orthognathic surgery, essentially the combined approach, we all know that the, the visit to an orthodontist means that they're going to cut out a school, they're gonna run and see their orthodontist, they're gonna change a wire or two, but when they're done, they can go right back to school, right back to sports, right back to all the things that fill their busy day. It's the visit to us as surgeons that doesn't let them do that. So if it's a 15 year old who has a class two deep bite, well then, it, let's say it's it's October 22nd. Well, the windows that exist on their calendar are summer of 21, holiday break of 21, summer of 22. I mean, you can kind of see how this is going to lay out. Now, the class three individual, I mean, there's three individuals or three cases that you want to hold and you want to make sure that they are skeletally mature. And maybe you heard me say, I'm a big fan of talking about maturity like a gas tank. If an individual has a high mandibular plane angle, if they have an open bite, or they have class three relationship that is mandibular based, mandibular hyperplasia, those are the patients that you want to say, grow, have fun, get good grades. It is not time to do it until we confirm that you are skeletally mature. At the same time, if you're a class three individual, but we've determined that it's more maxillary hypoplasia and not mandibular hyperplasia, then you have the ability to move forward beyond, you know, waiting until you're 18 or 19. I think there's a peer thing here too, Tony. Sorry to keep rambling. Sorry. Uh -huh. yeah. Remember, uh, if you think about our patients, and, and we're all going to treat them like they're our family. I mean, they're our daughters, they're our sons. But now you're thinking about senior pictures. You're thinking about moving away from the high school model and now into university or college. And so it's about timing this to make sure that we're hopefully accomplishing what we need to do from a foundational standpoint before they head off to the next venture of life. And, and that's, that's, that's a tough balance. Um, sorry, long-winded. Um, I, I don't know if I hit it, but I'm just trying to kind of tell you the philosophy of how I look at it. So just to make sure I understood one of the aspects or facets of your response, if it's, 
if the deformity is more related to maxillary hypoplasia, you'll have a tendency to operate on, on them a little bit earlier. Great. Awesome. Yeah, mid face deficiency. Not okay. worried about mandibular overgrowth afterwards. Great. Um, K wire. Do you, you alluded to it at one point in time as an ASEAN reference point? Do you still use it in the context of now that we're using virtual planned surgery? Do you still ever put a K wire in an ASEAN? Every case. Every case. Interesting. Yeah, and, and the concept of that is, um, and I know, again, guys, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir um, with Tony and, and uh, a lot of the other surgeons on the meeting, but Internal references. Remember, internal references are are uh, they're not they're not accurate. So you need an external reference. But the only way you can truly avoid, in my opinion, an external reference is if you're doing customization of the maxilla. Um, there are certain indications to do custom uh, maxillary surgery, and in my opinion, it's, it's very limited. It's just potentially where you're hanging the maxilla like a chandelier or you're bringing it away from interferences. But if you're gonna do a maxilla, it's stock plates. The only way to know where you're repositioning that complex uh, from a vertical standpoint is with an external reference point. Great, great. So uh, I think at this point, what I'll do is, uh, first of all, thank you so much, uh, Brian and Wendell for, uh, for your presentations. And uh, it was really very, very enlightening and, and interesting to hear uh, what you guys had to share with your your, your wealth of experience. Uh, I'd like to bring Miller back into uh, back on screen. Miller, if you're there. So, <clears throat> thank you, Tony. You thank you, Brian. Thank you, Wendell. Wendell, what a pleasant surprise! <laughs> I would have never allowed it. <laughs> uh, but once again, I think based on based on. Uh, the success of this webinar, I think we once again have to both thank Brian, Wendell, and KLS for their initial sponsorship of it. Prior to us going to our quick little happy hour, um, I do have to announce our next webinar. It's going to be Wednesday, November 18th it's at 8 p.m. Uh, it is going to be a presentation by Dr. David Shea from Boston. And his topic's gonna to be facial reconstruction in extreme settings. I thank everybody for attending this webinar. I thank Carl Cuddy for helping with uh, identifying our next speaker. And our next uh, webinar will be sponsored by uh, one of our other strong supporters to CLMS. So thank you very much for that. And